Welcome to Dweller of the Dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influenced many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers today. More tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten are climbing out of the tombs. Subscribe, comment, like, donate, or I'll send Thaddeus Forge to steal your heathen soul. Unknown horror masters, send us ghoulish delights for the Skull and Bones collection. Your pound of writer's flesh will continue to feed our ghouls for now. Books, websites, podcasts, in the links below. Children of Horror, Legion of Ghouls, tonight. The Gorgon by Jeffrey LeBlanc. First written May 2023. Life was the venomous serpent winding and slithering away. Obsidian eyes hypnotic cast murderously on its prey. His soul the prize, for where's the joy turning a man to stone? Blood and flesh are wasted when the soul is stronger than bone. Gorgon's Dance Prologue The Atchafalaya Backwater Basin South of Wallace Swamp Gibson, Louisiana November 3rd, 1992 After Midnight I hate the molten shimmer of silver the full moon cast on the swamp's waters. Its shine illuminating all through the wisping clouds as I try in vain to hide from a monster. The unearthly glow of this lecherous lunar dawn causes me to shudder and shake feverishly in the darkness. Maniacally, I cast my glances all around peering across the long shadows of Cyprus and Tupola, listening for a slither across the water-soaked duckweed or a hiss from above in the swaying Spanish moss or a thunderous cackle behind a creaking cypress. Onward I stumble, feeling the dampness of icy fog rolling in as I lumber and sway dizzily through black water and blackest night. I believe it's after midnight as I hunker down and pray for God to save me. Oh, how deafening quiet and deftly chilled is the night in Walla Swamp. Heavy are my eyes and heavy is the beating of my heart. Corpse stiffened are my legs and rigid are my arms as I mind-numbingly trudge in the darkness alone. The only embrace and the only comfort I feel in this moment are the cold arms of the ever-rolling fog and the iced swamp water enveloping me with each awkward fall. I stop a minute and move to lay against a half-submerged log. I want to laugh and try to push away the darkness. I want to think of anything to lighten my somber mood. Then I hear the call of a distant whippoorwill out toward the oak ridge and far from these muddy waters. It's a bittersweet moment that brings me a smile and a tear. How Uriel loved that strange nocturnal songbird. I recall back eight years ago, I remember the curls of her auburn hair. I could see the shine of her emerald eyes when they widened listening to the chorus of whippoorwill calls. I laughed as she reached out through the fog trying to pretend it was a blanket, gliding with the grace of an angel under another silver moon. 
she exclaimed excitedly, Charles, did you know they have over a thousand different songs? Listen, dear, it's so eerie how they cry out all through the cover of night. The night is theirs to play and frolic with the frogs and fireflies. They use these haunting notes each night to find their loved ones in the forest. Their songs aren't nearly as pretty to listen to as yours are. I gave her a loving, playful grin as we held hands in the night on my plantation deck. That was such a wonderful, magical time back then. Look, there's a trinos to provide me a better place to hide. Possibly this ditch may offer solace and a reprieve from certain death or worse. Worse, you may ask, doubting if anything could be worse than a snake bite in a remote swamp. I tell you as I die, trust me, there is. But maybe, just maybe, if I swim down this long winding ditch and submerge beneath the ooze of its obsidian waters, I buy myself a chance. Then again, maybe not. Of course, I'll have to overcome my abhorrent fears of what reptiles and leeches might lurk beneath those moon-glistened waves. What unnerving, wriggling, and squirming creatures await in the silt and slime to burrow into my flesh, I know not. But what choice do I have if I want to live to see another golden sunrise? But already, with this viper's venom in my veins, I'm slowing. My heartbeat skips, pauses, and races out of step. My very understanding of reality is being altered and twisted to such a degree that I question my brain's own lucidity. Helplessly, I feel all my efforts to live may be too late anyway. For my death, for death comes to us all in the end, in this hideous murk is soon. It's the other fate, a fate worse than death that I truly fear now. It's inconceivable and incomprehensible to imagine that horrific fate for should this monster I spoke of find me, I'll be mortally frozen for all eternity, encased and alive, mind you, as lifeless stone. Now you have some idea of what I fear. Now you know why I can swear to you that I do not fear my death. And I'm not frightened to dive into those obsidian waters that hold all manner of peril to my feeble frame. Why should I fear ordinary, natural menaces such as alligators, green leeches, or water moccasins lurking within those frosted waters and tar-pitched murk? They only seek flesh and blood. They can't devour and encase my very soul. As I have hinted, what is slithering and sloshing in the shimmering vastness of moonlight and swamp is something far worse and far more deadly. How that insidious beast chides and torments me out there in the pitch of this night. Where are you, Charles? I miss you, my dear love. I hear your owl splash and a distant hiss but can't determine her direction. I say nothing as the creature edges slowly and methodically past me. I hear the serpent sniffing for my scent as it searches for me in vain. Well, at least for now. Let's stop this foolish game. You are no sport to me. Once more this ancient unstoppable evil torments me while gliding up a cypress for a better vantage point to find me. 
again. I thwart her efforts, watching her from the Trinatus. She drifts to camouflage herself in the sway of those blankets of moonlit moss, hoping I panic and move. Her nocturnal eyes glinting in the moon's rays as she scans for me. There's so much I could say, but there is so little time left to say it. There is so much I should have done to stop her, but I failed to do anything until it was too late. So, with my blood boiling from the poison she injected in me, I'll leave you with a warning. It'll be brief, for I am dying. Should you encounter a Gorgon, take care to protect that which is dearest to you, your heart and immortal soul. For this creature doesn't just kill you. This beast doesn't just turn you to stone with a glance. She wears you down. She involves into the spiteful hate her kind are known for throughout the myths. So, beware, dear one, I implore with all I have left to plead to your senses. Never let this heartless, cruel, and ever vile serpent break your capacity for love. For it will twist all that is good in your heart. It will destroy all that you cherish dearly. Then, as you are broken of all hope, and you pray for mercy and maybe death, you'll reach out. You will be seduced into thinking, as I was, that she'll forgive and lend her benevolent love. But that thought will be a fool's folly, as it was mine, and to stone you shall become with the Gorgon's glare, all the while she steals your very soul. Living through the centuries, unable to move, but to feel everything of an eroding pillar of rock, you will plead for death as you eventually go mad. Charles, the time is drawing nigh on our tryst. Come out and accept your fate. Again I hear her serpentine voice hovering inches above me as she slithers out to another tree. I remain under the black waters as long as I can fighting the panic and feeling the burning in my lungs for air. What could you possibly know of the terror I'm feeling now? As I move up out of the moonlit water to breathe, can you imagine what I'm going through? You can't possibly know or relate to that spine-tingling chill crawling like a spider down my spine as I listen for what exactly? What could you conceive of that dripping dread that trickles at first as a gentle spring, then ultimately roars in chaotic pandemonium like the mighty Mississippi River in a flood? How can you know of such things, really? There is no salacious book or terrifying tome to enlighten you on what it's like to feel gorgon poison constricting your heart and slowly rotting your flesh. You can't hear the monotone whispers, and certainly you can't feel the vibrations coursing through me like a thousand insects droning in my ears and ripping at my flesh from that bite. Is this all an illusion, you may ask? Or can this be some cryptic allegory conjured in my mind, dear one? Maybe, like you must be thinking now, I'm hallucinating that I was bitten and poisoned by something. Maybe I've been drugged by a needled injection to my neck in the shadows by that peculiar Roman arch. I want so badly to believe the plausible and push aside the supernatural. But what I believe I saw was too fantastical. Yes, I got confused at what I exactly witnessed. I mean, everything happened so terrifyingly quickly. God, I still want to believe that is the case, you see, for my mind even now can't process the reality of 
being bitten by that malignant beast, Fangs. No, you can't possibly know if what I tell you now is true. For as I continue to run on fiery, aching legs, to dart from levee and tree, and try to evade the viper's glare, I still can't quite believe it. Hearing her sloshing and slicing across the water as she tries to circle and corner me like some terrified rat in a cage, I gasp in bewilderment while I anguish and groan, floundering and stumbling as a toddler in this nightmarish swampland landscape. I know the inevitable. She will devour all of what I am and all of what I was soon and exactly where my soul will be imprisoned, I cannot say. I climb back into the ditch and wade in. My eyes are wide and glancing from side to side, panicked the further I kick and breaststroke through the ripples and waves. I look up a moment to the moon's heavenly beams. Just for the briefest of minutes, I'm drifting off and dreaming, as is the wave when one nears death. I should have concerns of leaving myself vulnerable from my own splashing and noises, but I'm starting to not care. Onward I glance to the star-gemmed sky, floating and drifting with a gentle current. While I'm entranced with the celestial heavens, I rest wincing from the blinding silvery glare of the moon as my eyes become ever more sensitive from the venom. I try swimming again in the icy waters, but my rest in them has been too long. It is in the same instance my lethargic muscles cramp, pulling myself to shore before everything spasms and I drown. I try to stand, but as I try, I fall to my knees. Then another wave of blistering heat courses in my veins and rifles through my heart. My thunderous heart pauses a moment in my chest and my mind fogs while I try again to walk. In the moment, I trip again and fall into thick carpets of swamp grasses. There is true unnerving dread when I fall. Thinking I'm being grabbed by talon hands, I make every effort to do something to do anything to stop her from gazing on me. She will not turn me to stone. She will not steal my soul. She has long stolen and broken my heart. My heart's pause fades, and I feel the course of warmth to my face, fingers, and toes. Precious blood pumps, clearing the fog in my brain. My mind clears, and I can see by the glimmering moonlight the cause of my alarm. Dear Lord, <laughs> I groan and laugh, not caring if your out can hear me. I had become entangled within twisted black branches hidden in the grass and black waters. No talons have gripped and tore at me yet. Pulling up from the tangled menagerie, I stagger on. The skull white moon companions me though I still loathe it intensely with its blast of ghostly light. It lights my way to find safety. It lights the Gorgon's way to find me. Maybe I reach the saving grace of a frequented shell road. Possibly a night hunter or fisherman come to my rescue before my demise. Another half hour of trudging and swimming ever deeper into more ancient swamp. I feel, and I fear, she is swimming with me now in those chilled waters. But my head is fogging again, and I can't be sure. Confused to which way I should proceed, my head spins, and I'm further disoriented by darkness. Every time my knee hits an underwater branch, I flinch. Each unseen obstacle becomes a nemesis I must try and vanquish. I climb to shore punching poison-induced phantoms. I swim in circles of misdirection, unable to focus forward anymore. 
The latter effect is so intense. I vomit. Never has panic so clawed into my mind. Never have I felt greater isolation and loneliness in the vastness of decaying swamp with only macabre shadows and silhouettes to companion me. Hyperventilating and gasping for air, I tried to slow my hysteria, but the ever-growing shadow of dark knowledge, my impending demise, causes me to convulse again in lurking fear. With spine-tingling chills and panic-stricken thoughts, I think I'm going to die out here. When am I going to die? Will I be alone with just the cypress and creatures of the swamp when I do perish? Reality has set its own fangs. I've been hit with a fatal, venomous strike from a gorgon snake-lined head. Clutching and pulling at my chest, I go into further convulsed terror as the snake's venom momentarily stops my heart again. The reptile poison already attacks my brain with hallucination. Now the poison raises its head to lash out with new intensity. Overwhelmed with the first wave of psychedelic visions, I pass out in a wave of fluorescent crimson and violet fog. All the while, viper venom assaults my nerves and muscles, bringing forth convulsions and seizures. I falter and fall to my knees, delirious. Prayer can't console me or stop any of it. Onward I wade the labyrinth of black water and trees propping for support. In this first and dare I say last dance with death, I cry heartbroken tears. Despairing and sobbing, I say to the ice onyx water, the silverfish green duckweed, and the lonely toon gray cypress. Evie, why did I come out here? How could I have known she'd kill me? My dearest daughter, what abhorrent power she wielded to entice me into this abysmal swamp. Death's messenger, a necrose viper bite, reminds me that my time runs short. In the brilliant moonlight, I see the blistering purple abscesses where fangs struck my swelling right arm and side. I feel another and another compensatory pause in my heart. Steel stiffened muscle cramps return. Venom assaults again and I fall back into rigid black and iced silver swamp water quenching the roaring fires burning inside my head, heart, muscles and lungs. Submerged in black water, blanketed in duckweed and all manner of squirming creatures. My feverish brain and body blaze, temporarily extinguished. Doggedly, I stick my fingers into the mud and pull myself forward. I climb out of the water, emerge from the cold, life-saving waters. I observe the wisping tendrils of white steam emanating off my cooling core. I wade ever further in this aquatic labyrinth reinvigorated by the cool down. Then minutes later, venom sinks its teeth back into my mind. Poison, hallucinatory and psychedelic, twist my spiraling consciousness. Hallucinating, I hear above, below, and around me the following Gregorian chants while I lose where I am and when. There was the maiden knelt near a black stream. Allegiance and devotion she gave to a fallen angel in exile. Has the girl always been evil, heartless, cruel, and vile? Never pity this maiden, pity her poor reptiles. Chants repeat again to the right of me. Chants to the left of me. Chants above me and finally chants beneath my very feet, causing all manner of disorientation. My memory remembers the poem verses somewhere deep in the recesses of my mind. Ominous verses from an ancient cuneiform tablet we found in an ancient underground Greek temple 
dedicated to the Gorgons. Translated with my team of archaeologists, we had discovered one of the first poems dedicated to the demigod Ural. Upon first reading the verses, Ural, I must say it brought a mild sense of unease that I attributed to the dark foreboding atmosphere of that temple cave. However, reading the verses again a second time back at my plantation in Louisiana, I felt a recurrence of the spine-tingling malady. Had I known the artifacts procured were psychic keys or devilish harmonic manipulators? The answer most assuredly is no. If there was any evidence these devices could bend the gravitation and subatomic alignments between our worlds, we would have left the accursed items under tons of blasted cave. Sadly, in my blinded ambition and vanity, I did not, nor did I warn in time those who had helped me decipher the poem's translation. All who helped activate the harmonic keys, opening darkness from which that vile serpent slithered, have met ghastly ends. To my guilt and shame, I was too late to save my friends and colleagues from the Gorgon. All were tortured, tormented, and maddened by this abomination. In the end, many prayed for their deaths as I do now. I want my words to reverberate and be clear that this serpent, this abomination, this horrifying gorgon did not kill me in the end. It was my unquestioning blind love for Ural that has killed me. Though I forgive her even now for my murder. For as we know, a reptile has no capacity to understand the nature of a warm heart. Our Gorgon is not intoxicated with the euphoria brought on by attraction, desire, or love. Cold, analytic detachment is the blood in its veins, and ice is its demeanor when circling warm-blooded prey. The immortal reptile by its nature is most certainly immoral. What is morality, right or wrong, life or death? when you are a creature of the desolate wastelands of immortality. I say again, this snake monstrosity can never grasp love or sacrifice. Life is meaningless to a gorgon when death exacts no toil from this serpent. Thus, I say, human frailty is an alien concept to the gorgon. The demigod has no capacity or desire to ever grasp love, compassion or mercy. I can envision your incredulity and skepticism as I have mentioned gorgons, reptile humanoids of mythologies, as if they exist. I most surely understand such disbelief in actual gorgons and the words I now write, but tell you I must that this Ural is real. I too thought as you that this being was mythological. Even when presented the creature's repugnant skull and corpse-strewn lair, we doubted. Disbelief continued long after we broke the seal between worlds. Broken harmonic seals that released Yuria from her demoniacal dimension, along with many more of her ilk. Dearest one, and all of humanity, for releasing this kind of evil was the greatest transgression to you all. I beg you, forgive me. I pray fervently that you are not changed forever with this horrifying knowledge. Especially for you, my dearest Evie, the revelation of Gorgon's hits too close to home. For Evie, the Gorgon Ural is your mother. Darling, the night is getting colder. Charles, my love, it is time to go home. I hear the reptile's hissing voice in my head from some form of telepathic or cognitive link. Then I see a distant slithering shadow. The silhouette undulates and slices between the cypress far behind me as I wade on through ever-darkening swamp. The stars of Polaris great Cassiopeia 
in Ural's sister Medusa shine brilliantly above, urging me on to find sanctuary in that delusional cosmic glance of Polaris. I remember fondly the poem by Lovecraft as I wait on in starlit splendor. Oh, how wondrous and soothing these great lights are in an endless cosmic eternity. These stars push back temporarily the isolation and loneliness. I feel their glowing companionship on my journey with heavenly prisms of white, yellow, and sky blue. By their lights, I wait silently between shimmering aquatic plants of Azola, Hornwort, and Anachronis. On through this cosmic lit universe, I traverse mud and vegetation with my celestial family. Splashes behind me are growing louder. I hear gleeful laughter. They both raise my slowing pulse with dread. My eyes widen and glance back at the silvered silhouette, racing to capture its prey. Ural has gained distance to ensnare me, running for dear, precious life while maniacal in my thoughts. I can drown myself beneath the marsh grasses. I'll bury myself in the swamp rather than be her victim. I won't be Ural's victim. Evie, and whoever will read my words, I have little time left before I pass on. Research and read all the literature on the nefarious Gorgons. Most of the Greek mythology is accurate about the Gorgons. This is an ancient race either evolved or cursed. Created amalgamations of human reptile or some other hybrids. Review the weaknesses of the three Gorgons, Theno, Ural, and Medusa in literature. But don't be fooled, their race ends with them. I'm quite certain a population exists that may have come forward when my team and I opened the diabolical abyss, letting them slither free. And if I've taught you anything about Gorgons, never watch their stone-inducing gaze and stay clear the hair of poison snakes. I trip over something and fall mouth open into the black waters. Grain like duckweed pours into my mouth with all manner of scurrying and squiggly things choking my throat and clogging my nose. Pulling out from underneath the sulfurous, rotting water, I gag and stagger next to a nearby cypress knee. Retching up black water, I sneeze a leech out of my nose. Strands of slime and snot pour from my mouth slapping at my hands and pulling up the torn leg of my pants. I panic instinctually. More glistening black leeches are stuck on my hands and legs. I tear them off, watching their slime and blood ooze in moonlight on nearby flora. My last fall with the phantom glow is seen by predatory viper eyes. Charles, is that you, love? The voice is more a hypnotic hiss than words. Charles, what a misunderstanding. If you can't talk to your wife, who can you talk to? Come on now, I never hurt you or Evie. Muriel knows my soft spot is you, Evie. She's leveraging and I know it. Still as a statue, I say and do nothing. Any sound will give my exact location, and she'll have her next victim. Young man, hide and seek his offer. This isn't funny anymore. You could die from that bite. Hissing her last words, I want to tell you out she is wrong. This was a diviner tragic comedy. The fire in my side, the erratic flutter of my heart, and the spreading poison reminds me to stay on guard. If I had any misgivings, the next wave of flutters and spasms reconfirms my finality and her lies. I wasn't bitten by a spider, 
I wasn't poisoned by an ordinary snake. It was no injection she used. No hypodermic needle while my back was turned. Your owl transformed under the moonlight. And a writhing hair of snakes did their worst. Call me mad if you like. Call me delusional if it makes you sleep easier. But I swear before I leave this world, Evie, I'm telling the God's honest truth. Husband, you don't sound well. Let's go to the hospital. You just got bit from something that fell from that weird arch. The hypnotic effect of her voice whispers me to go to her. From the encroaching sound of leather sliding on water, I figure you're out. Can't be more than a hundred feet to my east in the marshes. I hear you're out writhing and crashing marsh grasses and reeds of the gigantesque floating islands bordering Black Bayou. I make note of my bearings to move away from Black Bayou as best I can. While getting my logistics, the poison attacks again, bringing me in and out of a swoon as my heart flutters. Once it stops, I realize I have passed near Paiutesh, but can't tell if I have journeyed past the lighthouse near the marshlands of Rice Island. Death is close now. I can feel the ancient siren's call to sleep forever. I pause to sit on a rotted willow stump, listening further to the music of death's serenade. In that sweet final orchestra, I hear crickets chirp, cicadas hum, frogs bellow, light breezes blow, mosquitoes buzz, and bats twitter all around. This swaying row of glistening willows along the water is a peaceful place to rest. It's a good place for me to give up my ghost. Most certainly, if I can, I'll come back and haunt this gorgon, you can bet. It's the least this evil bitch deserves. But now, my chickens have come home to roost. No more wasted time on triviality and things that never really mattered anyway. I take a deep, agonal breath, thinking, was anything she said real? Or was all of it camouflage to lure in prey? I truly can't say if there was any part human in that monstrous reptile. Magenta, sky blue, violet, emerald, green, and blaze yellow flash in my vision and swirl in my mind. The effect overwhelms me, and I fall to my knees, retching. Afterward, I fall back onto wet, soggy black ground, hearing the soft crunch of willow leaves beneath me. Lying on my back with a wan smile, I hear the rustle of grasses, the scratch of reeds, the movement of black water, as I peer skyward to the heavens to see brilliant white constellations, again of Perseus, holding that abominable head of Medusa. It seems maddening thinking such a terrifying thing could occur. That Uriel will cannibalize me. I can't comprehend fully. But then I think, I'll be dead. Why would I care if my corpse feeds this gorgon? My arms are tiring as I use the ditch and the currents to push my ever-paralyzed body more west. Both my arms are locked and immobile for a moment. I incur a longer seizure while drifting on green, silver, and black currents. How I didn't drown, I cannot say. The moon from my vantage point in the water shines hues, a brilliant white illuminating silver grass silhouettes on the great swaths of marsh. Floating further, I pass the winding oak ridge hearing the whippoorwill singing away, happily. I cry as I pass, remembering the woman and not the devilish snake. Sobbing 
uncontrollably for the woman I lost to darkness and drifting on the ever-widening waterway. I glance helpless at the bank of what looks like Raccoon Island, but I truly can't be sure. Onward floating as the dead leaves of autumn, I stare on the silver, ghostly moss hanging from a collapsed hotel column on Haunted Last Island. Finally, by some miracle, I can move my left arm and hand in the tumultuous waves of silted water. I decide to make a valiant effort to reach out and grab what looks like a cypress stump. The rotted log is attached to part of a levee adjacent to the canal. I decide this is a more reserved and appropriate place to let my soul pass onwards and hopefully, for I believe I was a somewhat good man, upwards to those twinkling stars. Waiting for the last wave to end, I stare to the night sky in hope. I view the infinite constellations with the brave Perseus and Cassiopeia as my guides. Starlight ripples and swirls in the obsidian and silver water around the stump. During my wondrous gaze, I hear the breeze and scurry of things above in moss blankets shrouding gigantesque cypress branches. Onward I sway and stare, feeling a little cooler with the wax and wane of fever. These wondrous stars build my resolve and steal my strength ever slightly that I slowly pitch and slide to the next bank. Guided by the heavenly lights, I peer out in that vast, foreboding darkness hidden by the decaying tree. Reckoning by the absence of her serpent voice and her slithers, I put miles behind me and this serpent queen by now. Why haven't I died yet? Why do I go on? Why keep journeying and evading Uriel? I move again for some reason, drifting further and farther on a floating log that guides me into a tranquil tributary toward an island of dreadful distinction. As I drag my feverish, cramping body out of the mud and the muck, I survey and realize why the locals call this place Skull Island. Lifeless, aged bones covered in vines, mosses, and mounds of dirt and leaves created this sepulchral island. Dragging my body further to explore the place, I cut my hands on something. Maybe it's crushed bones and skull fragments. Maybe it's just a beer can. All I know is my blood glistens shiny and black whilst it pours over the piles. I continue forward, crawling and waiting ever so slowly. Onward, in agony, I arduously continue scaling over the bones and landscape. I stumble into a moonlit clearing that absolutely causes me to pause in surprise. Cold, silver, and tomb gray forest lifelike human and animal statues greet me. My first observations noted the physical positions of the creatures contorted in all manner of lifelike poses. Birds, reptiles, insects, and mammals of stone were positioned in the trees, waters, and even on the ground in statuesque numbers I'd never seen. In awe, I saw detailed skin textures fine follicles of hair, and even damp perspiration oozing from the statues. White, lunar rays brilliantly blazed the buried tangles of yellow-brown grass and twisted black rushes adding to the aura of the macabre. On I stared at these marble and stone oddities, noticing a great curiosity in several of the statues having clothes. I say to the ghost of stone, these phantom pillars, why are you here? By what strange alchemy are your details so precise and your position so natural? Why do you, my statue friend, wear clothes? 
Charles, let me help you. Your friends are not statues. The Gorgon's hissing voice was terror beyond comprehension. Dread and despair had finally broken me. Under normal circumstances, I would have bolted away as a panicked deer, poisoned, beyond exhausted, my body slowing to die. I turned cautiously trying to catch her reflection. I took in these terrifying moments with that beast as a deadly sense of relief. Panic stricken, my heart beat ever faster hearing the slither to my left, knowing at once your owls planned to see me clearer. Looking around, I didn't have to guess the why as my blood turned to ice realizing her hellish plan. The venom fever, no longer a raging furnace in my head, frosted my mind with fear as I heard the rustle of marsh grasses and another splash to the right of me from the writhing half-monstrous snake. Realizing all ports of the Gorgon legend held true, all caution was taken to avert my eyes to Uriel's face and eyes. I made it a point to not even chance a secondary reflection of this viper. I shrugged and took a deep ragged sigh. I pointed to Uriel's graveyard of victims with my head cast down. So this is what true hell looks like. Immortally set in stone feeling everything but unable to do anything as the ravages of time erode you to dust. Let me guess, Uriel, you did all of this. And to think, since we first met, when you were in human form, you didn't even hide your name. I guess because no one remembers any Gorgon these days but your sister Medusa. I shook my head and tried to sit. Shadow, Uriel, spoke reverently and even solemnly. It's not that I wanted to deceive you, my love. The universe controls my fate as it does yours. I can't control my nature. The serpent always raises its ugly head in the end, mind you. But innocent insects, animals, and people, you turned, Uriel. How do you explain all this? I knew death was inevitable or worse, but at least I'd know this mystery. I could hear the hissing voice, then the writhing and twisting from her hair of snakes with their own smaller hisses, in a voice that seemed flat and disinterested, but I did hear her stomach groan. I guess my rotting, decaying body was making her hungry. I can't explain all this in terms you'd understand. Besides, in this enlightened world, who believes in gods and goddesses, punishments, and curses, religion, and science anymore. By the way, there is no difference between the last two. Both always had their beliefs and foolish cults. Well, for the sake of a dying man, try me. I'd sat down next to what might have been a persimmon tree I kept my face covered, taking in gasps of air. I wouldn't be around much longer to know the secret. I loved the wrong man. Alchemist, sorcerer, demon, scientist, or god. Take your pick. Uriel's serpentine voice seemed bitter in its tone. It was hard to tell with all her hissing. It also seemed to me further away than I imagined. 
most likely looking out on her field of the dead. I know the feeling. I loved the wrong whatever you are. I groaned from the pain and I felt the loss of my bowels, but I encouraged her to continue. How does the power to turn biological tissue work? Here I am, tapped, a human statue, and some of the decaying clothing fell free, exposing more stone. You were always too curious for your own good. To answer your question, though, is simple enough. I learned to pause the curse of Athena with tachyonic aberrations and reptilian recombination. It's only a temporary fix, however. And I lose my human memories each time. Is a mercy for both of us, Charles. She moved in a little closer. At the end of each span of my human life, on the last full moon, the snakes return. She continued speaking, undulating in a circle around me. Eons ago, I was created with a biological imperative to kill man, woman, or even a child to reset my reptilian nature. My only rewards in killing or receiving human hormones to create emotions such as love, fear, and sadness. The sacrifice of a lover greatly strengthens my human longevity in the great change. You must admit sacrificing yourself is a far better death than these. You're out. Later clawed hands onto some of the statues and continued. Their souls are frozen eternally in stone. The flesh turned to granite, helpless, aware of everything. They eventually erode over time back into the earth. Imagine knowing what is happening around you, but you cannot move nor speak. You wither the dust under the weather and solstice. Then, your soul finally might be released. Focusing my pain and despair, I cried out to her in outrage. Was anything real with us? Were we always going to get to the point where I became your meal? I saw a shadow of her forked tongue dart as she continued. Fate placed you in my circle, Charles. We both know your soul was long dead by the evil and hate of this mortal world. I gave you love, our Evie, and a fulfilling life. I laid my spinning head back against the persimmon tree. It was semi-shadowed by moonlight. Taking out a Colt pistol I'd managed to have tied to my waist, hidden earlier, I thought of shooting her, then thought it'd probably be of no use. Then a second thought came to mind that might solve both our problems. Screaming triumphantly, thinking I bested this hideous gorgon. You can't eat flesh of a suicide. It's time to say au revoir, Uriel. I saw her shadow recoil in shock. Then I continued. 
it was all a lie and our poor daughter. You can't kill yourself, Charles. Your religion won't let you. <laughs> Yuriao laughed uproariously, slapping her tail thunderously on the skull-riddled ground. I screamed two rhetorical questions at her in protest. Have you no soul, Yuriao? Have you no compassion? I'll back off, dear, as you see. Come in, for now. Charles, we tell lies to get us through great strife sometimes. Don't we, dear? A soul, compassion, love, those are mortal coil. Your Yao's voice and expression were flat, cold, and all the warmth one would expect from a snake. I heard the words from the prophetic poem again. Groggily, I had a final thought, pleading to Uriel one last time. How will you explain this to Evie? How will you explain killing her father? In her next words, Uriel broke my heart. Evie is the future, our Gorgon future. I see, by the shock on your face, you couldn't conceive she is Gorgon too. All the signs were there, Charles, even at her birth, you must admit. Anyway, for your sacrifice, I will tell Evie a lie if you like. But you do your daughter a disservice not letting her accept the truth of her kind. A Gorgon unaware is dangerous. You are a vile thing. You've destroyed our family, Serpent. I'll let Evie know that if you let me. Please let our daughter decide if I was sacrificed or murdered by you. What harm? can I do? I'm dead anyway. Bargaining, I know I will fail. My thoughts are dark again with despair. I know Uriel will wait me out and I'll die. Then she consumes me or worse. Any correspondence to Evie will be destroyed. All I was doing was delaying and angering the Gorgon. I took in a haggard breath and sobbed a final plea. Please, Uriel, consider it a last loving request. Surprisingly, Uriel hissed a surprising answer. I'll honor your dying request. To be honest, Charles Thompson, I don't know how you still alive. Only one other man survived my bite. And it drove him mad. Slithering and crashing through the ghostly stone field, Uriel said in a bored manner, In the temple on the hill, I have writing materials. If you are dead when I get back, the ink and parchment. I won't be shocked. In the moonlit cemetery of Uriel's statuesque dead victims, I made out her hideous silhouetted form. I looked to the night sky in wonder. A skull white moon cast long shadows as I saw her traversing the statue graveyard to the temple's hill. The lunar light illuminated the serpentine monstrosity, revealing her towering height as she slithered. She had to be at least nine feet in length. Of course, her hair writhing snakes glinted 
and continued to hiss under the moon's beacon. Oh, how I remembered her beautiful human form and those auburn curls I'd ran my hand through countless times ages ago. No, they had fallen away, transformed into what looked like, by the light of the moon, cottonmouth vipers. Shuddering from fear and the fevered venom that has killed me, I recalled the moment those snakes split the flesh atop Uriel's head. Out of her skull and scalp, the white mouths of the vipers launched and bit me. I recoiled and fell out of the boat we'd been in. Swimming away, I turned for a moment stunned as Uriel continued her transformation into the black-scaled Gorgon. All the while, as I glanced back, I saw their cotton mouths grinning as they dripped their venom. Her transformation had indeed been the stuff of nightmares. I had dodged her powerful, deadly gaze when I'd fallen out of the boat into the frigid water. But I caught a glimpse in the fall of her human eyes bleeding and changing to eyes similar to the cotton mouth. As I said, I witnessed with tears and terror Uriel's once lustrous auburn scalp split with cold black hair of snakes and their eyes of polished silver. In her chains, she screamed in agony, reaching instinctually to help the woman I loved. I forgot the danger of doing so. That was the moment of folly when moonbeams illuminated the moving snake hair and I was struck by them. All the while, as I recoiled from the viper stings, Uriel's body cracked, contorted back and twisted deskly. I wish I could forget it all. I wish I could forget the moment when aghast I witnessed her appendages wither or blend into her body. I want so badly to lose the vision of seeing her shapely legs meld into an immense blackish gray tail. As I agonize remembering her horrific transformation, I feel the fluids in my lungs filling up and drowning me from the venom. Fighting to breathe, I recall when she launched out in her true Gorgon form to hunt me through the night. Maybe I can cash out anyway. Let's see if I can try and raise an arm to hit my head or raise the gun and just end it all anyway. For all is lost now, I'm sure. Her metamorphosis must have been of the most intense pain. I can only imagine the screams of her spine twisting and breaking to form her tail. The stretching and contortions had to have broken bones and twisted organs to make her more serpentine. What havoc her stretched vertebral column had to endure, only the gods could know. What does life feel like in the last moments? of a dying man in a swamp. Life in those last waning moments stood still. As the blood slowed to my stopping heart, I looked up in peaceful preparation at millions of beautiful neon yellow, sapphire, azure, and verdant stars twinkling away. I smelled my last fragrance of cypress, tupelo, and the fecund decay of swamp while continuing to enjoy this crisp wintry night. I heard chilling winds move leaves, branches, and twisted old trees, causing low moans and creaks. On I listened with delight. The many animals in neighboring swamps such as nutria, owls, and muskrats as they cried out in the silence and made territorial splashes. As I nodded on the precipice of certain death. One unafraid muskrat swam right next to me, giving me a start. I couldn't help getting one more laugh <laughs> at the beast as it crawled up out of the marsh water, shook his fur free of icy water, and splashed me to my surprise. I laughed, a second pain laugh then, but a rewarding one. It took a little longer 
than expected? I bark out words between the blood and green bile, clotted cough. Uriel sits in the shadows, fully aware to keep me out of her stone-inducing gaze. From what I gather, I'm to be eaten when I'm dead, and she's making certain of not changing me. Yes, I'm not used to my dinner making requests. Again, no emotion, icily cold and non-human. It was such a contrast to the human woman who had radiated compassion and warmth before her transformation. Your time runs short, Charles. I dictated the words to the Gorgon that you read now. My precious, in whom I love with all my heart, Evie, if you are reading this letter, my dearest daughter, then I most certainly have passed on from my injuries. My darling, your father made a terrible miscalculation and I have paid the highest price for my blunder. At your mother's request, I was asked to not spare you what actually has happened to me. Evie, I have been poisoned by a snake bite inflicted by your mother. With all my heart, I wish the love of my life, Uriel, your mother, had not murdered me. Please forgive her for this act. Mother will explain in great detail why I was killed and the nature of the illness that caused her to take my life. I know you will feel my loss. The sadness and great loss of my passing may even be more than you can bear. But be comforted knowing, Evie, I go to my death blessed. I was loved by you and your mother. Evie, as I stated, your mother has an illness that may have an ancient cure. Research everything you can to help your mother and yourself. I pray deeply in these last moments that by some miracle, Uriel's disease has not passed to you, and you will have a loving and happy life. My sincerest regret is that I will not be there with you to see and experience it. But if there is a heaven, for with this magical, deadly beast, there must be one, I'll be smiling down on you. Now, my dear Stevie, in death, I will have the sweetest dreams that no mere mortal dared to dream before. Forever know you are the one great thing in my marriage with your mother. Love eternally, Dad. The Gorgon had tired of the dictation from her husband, Charles Thompson. When Charles's head slumped after his last gasp, Uriel smiled gleeful anticipation. There was a rumble in the undulating viper's stomach. She unhinged her massive snake jaws with a ratcheting crunch and click sound. The mouth and throat expanded and opened as a great anaconda or a python's does to devour. Sheets of long, slow saliva streams fell from her unhinged jaws. Droplets poured onto the back neck and head of Charles as his heart took the last quivering beat. Rancid, stomach churning, reptile breath warmed the freezing corpse of Charles as it closed to devour the decaying man. Hours went by as Charles's body was crushed and absorbed under the weight of Uriel's powerful muscles and digestive enzymes until nothing of the man remained. If Charles digested the Gorgon slept in a kind of gelatinous cocoon of reptile scales and black flesh. Hours passed, and there were ripples and waves in the cocoon. Then great slabs of reptile skin and opaque scales cracked and fell away. More sheets of ooze and slime poured out as the cocoon withered and fell away in the late afternoon sun. The great moccasins of hair retracted back into Uriel's skull. Back into her human form, Uriel twisted and swam as she breached out of the cocoon of crimson ooze and black slime. Chunks of foul-smelling sludge 
that once had been the venomous reptile form fell off Uriel. Breathing heavily, Uriel strained and groaned in her several attempts to stand, finally gaining strength to walk as a toddler learns to walk. She stood, then staggered, and fell back to her knees, dizzy. Uriel's memories of her life were amnesic at first. Her own head swirled with a thousand years of chaotic thoughts and recollections. But then a kind man's rugged, smiling face stuck in her head. For the first time in Uriel's loathsome existence, she wanted to remember that face that had made her laugh and cry. The two of them, holding a child, a daughter, brought more bewildering images that were equally confusing and chaotic as a continuous multicolored strobe light. Wiping the last of the reptile slime from her eyes, one image had caught her interest. The single object by the shrewdest of adversaries had made a profound impact on the Gorgon. For Charles, in his death, had made the Gorgon for once in her miserable existence accountable for her actions. Uriel saw a parchment letter written in a script that could have been her hand. The parchment was secured underneath the stone cardinal next to an old red and gray cypress. Waves of recollections like the bursting of a great dam filled Uriel's mind. She remembered. Uriel remembered the love of her life lying lifeless next to that swaying persimmon tree. She remembered the sound cracking bones, felt the splash of warm blood, and smelled Charles's decomposition as she had devoured him. Swooning in disgust, she vomited. In the pile of regurgitated ooze was a wedding band. Uriel screamed. Thank you for listening. Have a great night.